Hello. Hey, Sam. Hey, Matt. Nice to meet you. You too. Yeah, I'm so glad that uh, our digital avatars could uh, arrive in this particular plane of space time tonight. Uh, I think <laughs> I think I reached out to you back in March. Something like that, yeah. A week or two before the whole pandemic thing started and I was hoping to get a uh, cup of tea with you or something in Berkeley. Which I'm looking forward to that. Maybe another time. Maybe another time. I hope so. But uh, in the meantime, hopefully uh, this will do as a way of, of just beginning to sort of meet uh, minds and souls. Um, you know, the reason I reached out to you originally was I had just listened to uh, a podcast that you did with Joe Moore. I think it was the Occult Sentinel podcast that he was doing. This was back in 2015. And um, you were talking about Whitehead and magic. And uh, it's a, you know, I'm a, a Whitehead scholar and, and philosopher, and I sort of dabble and have an interest in magic. Many of my friends, some of whom you know, I think, um, Aaron Weiss and uh, Stephen Goodman, um, they were excited to hear that I was going to talk to you uh, tonight. Um, yeah, so I, I thought, you know, uh, at um, the Graduate Theological Union. That's right. Wonderful. So um, it was it was nice to discover that that we sh we share some some circles uh, and friends and um, I wonder if you would accept the way I described you um, earlier. I, I I sent out a tweet asking people what they might want to questions they might want to ask you and um, I described you as a white headian telemite Vajrayanist Wiccan. Did I leave? Is that accurate? Did I leave anything out? <laughs> That's reasonable. <clears throat> I consider myself religiously pagan um, of the Thalamic variety, but um, what I've ended up doing is deconstructing most of it, partly through white Hidian tools and a couple other tools is that, and I've ground it all back to its origin points, which is theurgy. Mm -hmm. And theurgy yeah. is basically a primitive form of Vajrayana practice. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the parallel timing in India versus Greece, India is just a little bit ahead, but then Greece gets stopped and India continues to develop. And so, right. uh, but you can see the similarities at the, at the root, which makes it easy to translate um, the material and use uh, Buddhist practices. I don't know if you know about my book on this. Um, I have read the titles of all of your books and I hope to one day read your actual books um, cover to cover. Uh, because there would, uh, there's a lot that I would love to learn about these intersections. Um, well, Patrick Thalema is the principal one I'm talking about. And it's <clears throat> basically, if you take a look at the Book of the Law and you look at the genre of tantras, mm -hmm. they're astonishingly similar, particularly in terms of content, uh, except the symbolism is Egyptian, except it's Golden Dawn G Egyptian. So if you don't know your Golden Dawn, you have mm -hmm. to kind of reverse engineer it and back. But once you can see that pattern, it gives a worldview, it gives a mode of practice, and it gives a deity form with which to wear and to become in that practice. And so, okay, that's good. And there are books on how to develop a practice uh, if you don't have one in the Tibetan tradition. Uh, a lovely one was translated by H.V. Gunther, which is called uh, Creative, Re uh, Creative um, uh, no, symbolic recreation, that's what it is, I'm forgetting my names. Oh, great. And it's it's gives the method. And so I built a practice around Raharquit using the, uh, the symbolism from the Book of the Law and Egyptians and stuff like that in a tantric framework. And it worked very powerfully. And mm -hmm. so in the Golden Dawn work that I do, uh, our adepts uh, master that practice. And for some, uh, they've used it to attain to knowledge and conversation. So it's right. uh, been useful for them. Yes. Uh, you mentioned Gunther, who's a connection point between us. Um, mm -hmm. I've read his book, um, Matrix of Meat. Uh, Matrix of Mystery. Matrix of Mystery, right. And he, he seems to have um, understood Whitehead at a deep level, um, I think. And uh, I, you know, um, through Aaron Weiss and, and Stephen Goodman and other friends who are um, students of Tibetan Buddhism and Vajrayana practitioners, uh, 
I, I have learned what little I know about, about that side of it, but um, the systems theory stuff and the, um, the Whiteheadian process thought helped, you know, the way that Gunther was using process philosophical language to translate Tibetan uh, ideas was, was helpful for me. I don't remember him using a specifically Whiteheadian frame, was he? It's been a while since I've read the book. Uh, does, I think he cites Whitehead in that text. I'll have to check it again. Um, the thing is, is that the Tibetan language uh, is a process-oriented language. And so it suits the task very effectively. Our language mm -hmm. is you know, to very substance uh, oriented. And so you kind of have to break out of the linguistic framework if you really want to use, you know, Whiteheadian uh, kind of bounds. But my experience, uh, my year out of seminary was no one understood me. I could talk and just like nobody got it. I could blah, blah on, it was like useless. So I ended up just retranslating most of Whitehead into um, Renaissance Neoplatonism, since basically right. he seventh generation Platonism, so to speak. Right. Yeah. You know, if you do Plato is one, Middle Platonism is two, Neoplatonism is three, then you get uh, Renaissance, now maybe church Renaissance, um, and then uh, early modern and then Whitehead. And yeah, I love that. It's like, yeah neo-platonism to the seventh power or something and you end up with whitehead yeah, yeah. And he fixes the problems with greek philosophy you know the yeah. obsession with stasis when i finally found somebody who would say okay why are they like this well they thought that anything that was still moving or changing couldn't be finished therefore isn't really real mm -hmm. and that suddenly loses you all process right in whitehead well in whitehead it works but in in Pro proclus and the Neoplatonists, it, this causes the proliferation of entities because mm. you can't blend two things. There's no transition. A thing right. has to be a thing or another thing. And so you need a bridge in between and you end up with tons and tons of stuff. Right. But that's Proclus. So I work in at uh, Iamblichus's level, which is so, you know, Proclus is around four and a half, Iamblichus is about 380, and it's simpler and it's cleaner. And the methods that he outlines are extremely effective. And so uh, what I've been doing is um, redeveloping all that stuff. Um, one of the fun parts about it is that the scholars don't understand it because they don't do ritual. But I'm, I'm a rich, highly skilled ritualist and I know yeah. what he's talking about. And I'm not afraid of doing pa pagan things. There's no paganism in the ancient world. That's a misunderstanding. Um, but uh, I, what he's describing didn't seem all that weird. I mean, I, he's basically saying, you know, in the later phases, well, after you get down with the early phases, you stop killing things. So, okay, fine, I've done all that beginning work. Now I can just go about doing offerings without having to, you know, slit some goat's throat. And we started doing it and we discovered that the method works wonderfully. So contrary to what the scholars say, he actually outlines how to do it because none of them know how to do ritual. They didn't understand it. So uh, a couple of years ago, <clears throat> I got to present for the International Society of Neoplatonic Studies. And uh, I got up in front of the, the best of the scholars of it and said, so gents, did you notice this one before? And I took what uh, Iamblichus says, and then I took what uh, Walter Burkert outlines as the paradigm of uh, Greek or Olympian sacrifice. And I said, now look, this isn't that complicated. This is how these two things go together. And I outline the entire process of how you do it. And any modern magician would just say, well, well you're just applying the correspondences. And uh, yeah, that's really all it is. What we call correspondences, they had a different word for it, but it's the same principle. And once you understand it, it just applies. And then that gives you a ritual. What I didn't tell the scholars was, then we went and did the ritual and did it a bunch of times. And we discovered that it works very effectively. The deities come. Can't hear you. You, uh, you. Sorry, I I unmuted myself. Um, something seems to have happened, uh, maybe associated with the scientific revolution, or maybe it was a little bit later with the Enlightenment, where like this connection to theurgy seemed to maybe it was always underground, but it seemed to be even more marginalized, and and the obsession with theory and the hypo hypothetical deductive method of of, of science. Um, and the instrumentalization of knowledge so as to gain 
technological control over nature. Mm -hmm. These all following from a focus of, on theory and a loss of a connection to any theoretical practice. Do you think that that was a, is this a real historical moment that occurred when something yeah, was lost or? It did. Um, what's your, what's your religious background? What, what, how were you raised family wise? Uh, complicated question. My mother is uh, Lutheran. If her parents were Lutherans. My father's Jewish, who kind of lapsed Jew by the time I was born. Though after they got divorced, they, my dad's Judaism became more something he wanted to get me to participate in all of a sudden. His parents died around the same time, so I think it was a guilt thing. So anyways, it's complicated. I'm kind of mixed. Um, well, um, my doctorate is in religious history. Uh, mm -hmm. So trying to figure out how this all worked out was my, my effort. And really what we have to blame is the Protestants. The <laughs> progressive rejection of ritual that yeah. comes from Luther forward is enormous and incredibly damaging to the Western psyche. We are the only culture that's a non-ritualizing culture except for a couple of random other bits and pieces. And you get some oscillations like between the Vedic traditions and like the Buddhist traditions, but then the Buddhists go back to ritual and all this kind of stuff. What Iamblichus was talking about was you can't get to heaven in a rocking chair. You can't sit there and just think your way there unless you're Plotinus, but Plotinus had already done his work. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing is, is that it is through acting, through actually the doing, Doing. that actually change occurs. And a mere theoretical understanding of the construct, construct of the world would mean that somebody would memorize their Kabbalah and then they would attain to the greatest heights. And that's just not visible. I know too many magicians who could run rings around me with data about Kabbalah, and yet they can't invoke to save their lives. That's what counts. Can you call? Can you invoke? Can you feel? Can you change? Can you actually do the work? And then, my gods, it's so simple. And so profound. Yeah. And, you know, I love the way, you know, to, to link this to Whitehead, the way that he describes the human body as a complex amplifier and the way that I have heard you talk about magic as a way of tuning ourselves to the frequencies of the cosmos mm -hmm. um, so that it can talk to us. <laughs> yeah. You know, as they wait for us. Anyway, the world is one vast communication. And it's yeah. ritual technology that allows us to participate in that communicative yeah. cosmos, right? Mm -hmm. Teaches us to hook up, and it also is part of the purification process whereby we get rid of all the garbage we've taken on. Yeah. We've taken on an enormous amount of, a huge amount of really negative, uh, complex eternal objects have ingressed into our process of self-becoming, our concrescence. Mm -hmm. And that is distorting us and keeping us from actually knowing our, our divine subjective aim thereby eliminating our ability to actually hear what's going on. However, what we've learned is through a progressive process of invoking the gods, starting at the lowest level and working up the chain, even though it looks like the same gods over and over again, what happens is as you go around the circle, you meet them at higher and higher levels. It's like walking up a spiral uh, staircase and it becomes an entirely different thing. But the only thing that's changing is us. We become more fit or the Greek word epithidiotes. We uh, are more purified and prepared for the gods. And their yeah. concept of catharsis is not just the negative removal, but also the strengthening of all the things that are really us and attuning us with the divine and the wholenesses of the world. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I mean, this kind of connects the way you're talking about all of the um, negative complex eternal objects that have ingressed into our, our souls. Um, I, I hear there maybe a resonance with uh, the sort of mimetic wars that are unfolding in our current social and political situation. And the, I, it seems to me that, that there is a, sor a sort of um, black magic going on in, in this. And um, I'm wondering, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is um, as a practitioner, how do you or do you uh, interface with these dark uh, powers that are clearly using ritual technologies, but that nowadays go under, you know, come in the form of, of like advertisement and public relations and Facebook algorithms? And um, how do you or do you interface with, with the misuse of, I think, a form of magic 
by the sort of techno capitalist machine that's eating the planet alive right now. Well, um, I agree with your framing. Let's start there. Um, what I've done is instead of going after the bad, which I mostly don't have the power to do a whole lot about, I tend to build the good. And it's really easy to protest and argue and say bad, bad, bad. But often there's no alternative. And it's the great, great sorrow of this world how people have been cut off from the gods. And they don't even know that there's so much resource, so much available to them to guide them, to instruct them, to show them how the world works so they can participate in it in a healthful manner. But they've all had that taken away from them. So what I do is I teach people how to find their way back. Part of my approach to things includes the complete eschewing of belief. Anyone who works yes. with me will hear me go on at length about, don't you believe a thing out of my mouth? Test it, test every bit of it. Just like the Buddha said, do not believe me. Test my practices, find out where they get you. A certain, right. Assure yourself of what this does. And so for from 2001 to uh, 2019, I ran the open source order of the Golden Dawn with my colleagues. And uh, we taught a lot of people. We initiated well over 100 people. We produced over a dozen adepts. And, um, you know, they're out there kicking butt. <laughs> so that's kind of my approach because I don't have the leverage. I tried to build a, a nonprofit uh, in paganism, um, the, the Pantheon Foundation. Pagans are allergic to money and they don't really handle it well. And I ended up having my career destroyed by a whole bunch of people lying about how evil and so forth I was. And it kind of ended a lot of my work. So I had to back away from all that and go on to other things. Yeah, so there's something, I mean, maybe we can back up for a second. Um, I'm sorry that that happened to you and, uh, Thanks. and, you know, but maybe we can back up and talk about how we might even begin to distinguish between black magic and, uh, you know, and uh, magic operating out of love. Easy. Is What's it, that? It's relatively easy. Is it harmful? Yeah. And I'm not, just talking, I'm not just talking damage, I'm not talking hurt, I'm talking harm. And you can see that over time. Sometimes it's not always obvious. But I, I will stand for the importance of wrathful compassion. You know, the, the wrathful Buddhas are considered the most compassionate ones because they'll smack you upside the head and say, you're doing it wrong. And that's a very valuable thing. Getting, getting lovingly corrected or even strongly corrected can be quite precious. Yeah. But the other side of it is acquiring wisdom and judgment. And that we get from, well, okay. I use the language of the gods, but please understand, language of the gods is the theological and theurgic language. I could be saying all the exact same thing by talking about the primordial eternal objects that were envisioned by the, um, the, the you know, the, the, the white Hidian phrase is the primordial divine envisionment to the greater relevance of uh, if the, com the eternal objects. I turn that around a little bit. It's the divine, uh, uh, the divine envisionment of the primordial eternal objects. Mm -hmm. The reason why is because at the beginning, there is at least the three set, if not the 12 set, of the fundamentals that you have to have to create a cosmos. Mm -hmm. That's what the, that, that being, which we all are, of course. You see, we cannot separate ourselves from the one. In fact, the whole point of the early phases of theurgic practice is attain to henosis, your connection with the one, and realize that you're part of the all. But we're all there at the moment of creation because that we can't be anywhere else. And we were all part of that as it envisioned. So we can use theolo theological and theurgic language when we're doing ritual. And we can use philosophical language, but of course, these would be the Platonic forms in philosophical language, or we can talk about them as the eternal objects in white Hidian language, and then be able to use that to help us analyze what's going on. And with it, are the things we're seeing as promoting life? Are they promoting people's well-being? Do they make people kinder to each other or more violent to each other? Mm -hmm. These are the very, what the Buddhists will call making things more wholesome. Is this a wholesome activity? Is it an unwholesome activity? Mm -hmm. So when I look at advertisements, what is this asking me to do? What is this asking me to consume this time? What is it asking me to stand up for this time? And then I have to use my judgment and my understanding of the world to say, is that actually benefiting anyone? 
qui bono is always a good question, but what is going to be the consequence of this? And ethically, I'm pretty much of a consequentialist. I, I have some front end stuff too. But, you know, how does it work out? I don't care how pretty it looked on the front end. If I end up with a bunch of corpses on my floor, I'm not going to think well of it. Mm -hmm. And so we can look at that. And part of it is we now need to look with great askance at the capitalistic machinery that's slowly destroying our planet. We've yeah. only got 200 years left as a species if we keep this up. That's generous, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there'll be a major collapse and then a few other things and then a lot of bad stuff and then there'll be no humans. So it'll take a little while. We're, we're kind of like cockroaches, very hard to kill. But um, I used to work up at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, oh, wow. the Environmental Energy Technologies Division. I'm a typesetter by trade. I was doing their, their stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, my boss was the editor and I was the actual builder of uh, the report that America sent to the Kyoto Protocols. And five different laboratories contributed to that. And it all went through my head and my hands. So I've got all that up in there. And we're basically right on track for where we said we would be. And that's not a good, because if it keeps on going on that path, we're going to get up to, you know, four to six degrees C above where we were. And humans can't live there. Right. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of complex mammals probably can't. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, um, another step back question maybe is, do, do you feel like, and maybe this is about cosmogony or, or um, how we understand the creation of the world, why it happened, how it happened, is the fact that we even have to, that we even have magic in this world as a thing that we work with, isn't that already a sign that some kind of fall has occurred? Nonsense. And that maybe magic is an attempt? I deny this utterly, I deny this utterly. I will not accept so you any concepts of fall. I will not accept this as anything less than a holy place. Mm, right. So magic maybe then would be the attempt to restore a, a sense of- Magic uh, is a completely misunderstood concept in, um, yeah. amongst the magicians, never mind the scholars. <laughs> okay. When you actually, uh, one of the things I had to do for my doctoral thesis with my professor, Ronald Hutton, um, demanded that I come up with a definition of magic. So I read this enormous stack of material on everything everyone's saying about magic. And I came to the conclusion that they were all fucked up. They all had no idea what they were talking about and they were all wrong. And I got to have, after a while, a chat with uh, uh, Fritz Groff, who is one of the major writers in this field. And I got to meet him at the American Academy of Religions and sat down with him. Dude, dude, I appreciate what you said here. And I, I, your scholarship is utterly beyond me. He's like much senior, very senior gentleman. But I got to say, by the time I got done with reading all this stuff, there is no meaningful difference between religion and magic, is there? And he said, yeah, about two years after I finished that book, I got there myself. Keep going. What we have is an error that is produced by a different phenomenon that we confuse. What there is, is spiritual resources that we can apply some of which we consider legitimate, some of which we consider illegitimate. Every culture has its own way of dividing that line and they don't agree. So really what we're talking about is operational religion, operational spirituality. Sometimes people like it, sometimes people don't. Irrespective of that, what you're doing is applying spiritual resources to getting something done on one or another plane, physical, communicative, or mental. And what we know from the Buddhists is that every action that we do that's a willed action, whether it be of the plane of mind, the plane of speech, or the plane of uh, body, is going to produce change and karma. And these things we call magic are just tools that in one culture are considered Ooh, spooky magic. In other places, it's the thing you put behind the cash register to make sure your little business makes money. Next time you're in a, uh, an Indian store, Look behind the cash register. You find a little copper plate that's done up with a square of Saturn in it. Yeah. So, okay. It sounds like um, I appreciate your response to my cosmogonic question. Um, I, w I would like to return to you the, the question of how the world was created and why. Sure. But, but, but I'm also just curious to follow a thread around this, um, the role that ritual technologies play in healthy human societies. Mm. And... Um, in the lives of healthy individuals, because 
I think, you know, one way of talking about the shift from a substance to a process ontology would be the way we conceive of the soul. And, you know, if ritual technology is essential to the cultivation of a healthy soul, um, then it's like we're saying the soul is really this, it's a process of psychogenesis and we have to, 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 to water it and feed it and, and we need social, we need institutional and cultural sort of um, support for the process of psychogenesis and we don't have that right now. So the soul is not growing into the form that it should take if it had the right ritual technologies, you know, to scaffold it and initiate it. So would, so when we look at our um, political and our ecological situation right now, you know, do you, what, what role can magical practice, theurgy, uh, and Whiteheadian theory also, what, what role can these all play in, in helping and being, um, rather than contributing harm to the situation, but how can they help us heal this situation? Well, ritual is how you hack the soul. Mm. Okay. Um, for me, mm -hmm. uh, uh, my paper from my Whitehead class was explaining how ritual works from a Whiteheadian framework. And then redesigning one of the redesigning the lesser matching ritual, the pentagram, uh, more along a Whiteheadian framework with the uh, Thelemic symbolism. It's called the uh, Milk of the Stars. Uh, you can see it amongst my various papers. Okay, yeah, um, I need I need to read that paper. <laughs> it's uh, but the main point is, is that invocation is the willed ingression of complex eternal objects whereby to transform and change our soul. For me, concrescence is soul. There's nothing else there. You don't need anything else to do. Everything that's ever been attributed to soul, except eternality. Eternality, the error of eternality comes from focusing on eternal objects and thinking that they never change in the sense that it is eternal. And when you go into the plane of the eternal objects, into the noetic, there is no time the way we experience it. You're in eternity. And so, and, and this is uh, actually when I read that and then read this in Nagarjuna, it's like, oh, right. He's talking, Whitehead is even seeing. These things don't exist in time. Right. But they nonetheless ingress in us and participate in time by that. And they don't change at a certain level, but they uh, aggregate into all the complex, complex uh, complexes that are there. And that is all received by the divine. So it's preserved as we go forward. Right. So we have this process of canalizing our uh, attention on these complex eternal objects carefully laid out in orders that we have learned matters. Mm -hmm. And this transforms us. It's kind of like music, you know, the, the certain melody patterns really do things to us. Well, it's the same kind of principle, except we're using um, spiritual uh, drives rather than aesthetic ones. And so in our culture today, we do not have the tools by having dumped ritual, we do not have the tools to transform ourselves when we're maladaptive. And therefore, we have higher levels of long-term mental illness than any other kind of culture. Because we don't have the road out. Yes, people get to maladaptive modes. Their parent dies. They're, they've left home. You know, whatever those things are, they haven't adapted to that new state yet. That's where ritual comes in and creates the threshold in the you know, rite of passage structure. And you separate from the old state, you transition through the changes you need to, you re-aggregate yourself into the new thing that you're going to be, and then you come into that. And this, this pattern shows up so many places and it's in the process of concrescence itself. Right. So, but would you say that it's not so much that nowadays we've lost the, we, it's not it's not that we don't have ritual technologies it's that we have the wrong kind of ritual technologies we have the super bowl we have celebrity culture we have movie, like movies and entertainment and right. we but have these are media. liminoid not liminal they are not actually ritual they're ersatz ritual it's what we have instead of actual ritual right we sh the people who are going to the football game should be going to a bucket frenzy Mm -hmm. and enjoying all that same ecstasis, but with a spiritual focus so that it purifies them and drives them forward in their learning. Right. You have a divine focus, it's different. Instead of a bunch of guys running around on the field beating each other. <laughs> that doesn't do anything except 
all of that violence, even though it's mock violence, is going into all those people. Mm -hmm. What we know from, um, well, 911 calls is on the night of the Super Bowl, many, many women get beaten. Many women get beaten because of the violence of that entire affair. And so there's a lot of work that gets done on Super Bowl night and other times to save and protect women from yes. the, the violence that's going to be stirred up by that. And I, I don't have a problem with people who enjoy sports and all that kind of stuff. That's not really what it is. It's yeah, we Mars is a god correctly. Right. Yeah. I said Mars is a god that yeah. can be invoked on occasion and <laughs> it's perfectly fine. And uh, my principal deity is Hermes. And while I do not do competition, I'm usually the, like a mediator, uh, he's also Agonistes. He's he of the contest. And he really likes it. And then I always remember, yeah, in a boxing match with Mars, Hermes won. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, Hermes is the kind of the deity that you never want to get into a conflict with. There's right. no good way around. <laughs> Not like any of the other guys. You can deal with them, but him? Mm, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I, Hermes is is um, close to my heart as well. Um, and, you know, so I wonder, okay, so in, in terms of other ritual technologies, I think the um, the re the representative form of um, of electoral politics that exists in the United States of America seems to me to have reached a stage where um, it's it's no longer it's a ritual technology where whereby our the people elect their leaders right and we used most of America which for some time was just white men and then. And then black people got the vote, black men, and then later women, even after yeah. um, black people got the vote. So like the ritual technology has been, um, for a while it was kind of gaining legitimacy, but now it feels like it's lost its legitimacy. The ritual technology is no longer functioning as advertised. Mm. And the American people are not even recognizing themselves as a people because they've lost that magical bond you know, that, that, that ritual technologies allow us to perform and, and ritual celebrations, like the inauguration for Trump, like literally nobody showed up. So there's, a, there's like, there's a loss of legitimacy in the process by which we give rise to our national leadership mm -hmm. um, and our, even our state and local leadership. And so I wonder, you know, if, if we were to go in there as um, medical magicians, like how would we help, like what, do we need a new constitutional process that's rooted i mean the founders seem seem to have been adept to some degree or another in their understanding of ritual magic i think some of them um you had a number of masons there who are quite competent uh, well ritualists at least right so they understand the building of symbolism and all that towards the uh wholesome ends of the nation and mm -hmm. they really tried for that it, it's really important to understand that the the kind of religious basis for the United States was masonry at one time. Mm -hmm. And when they were figuring out how to set up the government, it was the masons in the room who said, no, we know that everyone else thinks that republics are discredited, but we make it work. And this is how we do it. And that ended up all getting written into the constitution. I'm also a mason, so I did a bunch of research on this as well. And the masons are actually proud of that, uh, that they had that influence. And then they blew it. <laughs> They really blew it. It was like in the 1430s or something like that uh, in upstate New York. Um, I think a guy, a Mason killed a guy and uh, then he fled to Canada and he kept getting let, he kept getting caught and let out of uh, jail after jail after jail because he did the Masonic hoo-ha and his brothers let him out. And uh, in that they discredited the entire fraternity and out of it arose the anti-Masonic movement which destroyed the moral hold that masonry had over the United States government. You said 1440, but I think you meant 1840 or was uh, it? Sorry, 1840. 1840. Okay, yeah, yeah. 1840s, 1830s, someplace. In yeah, there. interesting, yeah. So so what is is there a need for some magical intervention in, in the course of this, this country, okay. basically what yeah. I'm asking? We, we need to reestablish right ritual and right assertion of value. I mean, what what, Worship does. The word worship is worth shaping. That's how it linguistically breaks down. Mm 
-hmm. It's the idea that what we do there is we assert certain values. Mm -hmm. And so we've lost our civil ritual. Not entirely though, it's been perverted, mm -hmm. it's been sold, and it's been invaded. We do know that there's been an enormous cyber uh, um, disinformation campaign that has done fantastic amounts of damage. And until we can put the right people in place who will actually acknowledge that and deal with it, it's going to be very hard to purge. America is going to have to go through some really intense stuff. And part of it will be stepping up and enacting, embodying, and not just talking about the values that we have. And that's probably going to mean a bunch of people in prison. It's going to be probably a bunch of people who are going to have to be very badly punished. And that in, in, in that action, it'll be cathartic for our nation as we see, wow, all these people who were fucking us over, look, they're in prison now. Oh, look, a few of them. Well, uh, there's a particular person who I'd like to see on a pike out in front of the house he's currently living in. And maybe it'll slow on the ending process there. Eh, put that on YouTube. That'll be fun. It's like, <laughs> this is what happens with tyrants, you know, sick transit tyrannus. It's a horrible yeah. thing and it needs to be dealt with with enough vigor so everyone goes, you know, that must never happen again. Mm -hmm. um, things like um, we need to take seriously concepts of corporate personhood. And then when they break the law, they um, have to stop being traded. Uh, their stock has to stop being traded immediately. Cannot be sold, cannot be bought. Once, right, they're, right. Con once they're convicted, if it's murder, all of their stock is zero valued. And then all of their assets are sold off to those parties that didn't have anything to do with the crime. First, the uh, employees get it, but none of the executives. And then if they can build a business out of that, great. Otherwise, they just keep selling it off. And creditors know you're fucked too. Instead, it just goes out to who it goes out to. And that way, people will be suddenly in the realization, oh, hell, I'm a stockholder in this company. I could lose everything I have if this company breaks the law, especially if they kill somebody intentionally. Well. Then you get people saying, okay, corporate personhood, <laughs> corporate personhood. Uh, no, we don't want any of that. We want the corporate veil. We don't want this kind of responsibility. Good. Now go back into your box and leave our politics alone. It's so, it's it's so like unfortunate though how- Put in money. Yeah. Well, our, we're, our values are so inverted that we, we have the death penalty for uh, real people, but we don't have the death penalty for corporations. We reserve, we, 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 uh, protect corporations from capital punishment. Mm -hmm. I'm, but, but as you're describing it, like, yes, wow, I'm in favor of capital punishment for corporations. And it would, it would change the way that the whole system operates and bring a lot more virtue into it because people would know they'd suffer the consequences of uh, wrong action. Yep. So I like that idea a lot. Yeah, there's a meme going around. I'll believe in corporate pers personhood when uh, Texas executes one. Right. And when they pay taxes. <laughs> yeah, there's all that stuff, too. And those are the things is that, remember, they're immortal. Mm -hmm. They are higher on the food chain than we are. Oh, yeah. Okay. And humans go through phases where we put up with that. And then there's a real possibility that we remember that. And we actually do not permit predation upon ourselves. <laughs> That's why I don't believe in, in things like... Um, the vampires and the like, because if we never knew that they were around, we would go and we would hunt them and kill them. Mm -hmm. And there's been some of those in recorded history. I had some friends who were visiting Eastern Europe and they realized they were pinning somebody down dead, st stakes through the heart in the middle of a crossroad and they were, and the, the, the equipment was there to like cover over and pave the road on top of this thing. <laughs> they thought this person was getting up dead and chewing on people. Jesus. So they were making sure it wasn't going to do that anymore. Yeah. So what can I say? But like around here, you know, we don't have any big cats or bears or anything because we don't let things be higher than us on the food chain. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't do that to corporations either. Right, right. They were originally designed to just be small purpose, sp specific purpose entities for relatively limited periods of time. The original ones were only for 20 years. And then they found ways of making that uh, extended. Starters. Well, yeah. So like the Dutch East yeah. India Company was the first corporation, right? Yeah. Yeah. But when they started, when they created the laws around ordinary people making corporations, they were for limited time periods. Right. Yeah. Limited charter. And then yeah. they got extended and extended and mm -hmm. eventually 
I mean, it seems like the original purpose of the corporation was colonial exploitation, um, right? Of of the per, the the uh, periphery of the empire. Mm -hmm. you know, so well, it's a limited liability corporation. That's what its real name is. It has mm -hmm. to limit the liability of the people who own it. Mm -hmm. And then now we're giving it the same rights as anyone else. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get rights without responsibilities. Right. And with responsibilities come penalties. Mm -hmm. So, okay, um, let's get back to the, uh, the cosmogony question. Okay. That sound like fun? So, you know, the uh, cosmology of the fall, obviously, is one that um, I, I agree. I appreciate your, your uh, passionate re rejection of that. Um, and so when we think about the, the reasons for the creation of the world, um, how do we avoid um, cosmologies of the fall? Um, understanding what was going on in the beginning, and it's not that hard to understand. You know why we have creation? Because God was bored. Boredom. Yeah, boredom. Boredom com combined with complete self-love, complete all power, and all wisdom. Because there's only one being, it is it all. So it has it all. Mm -hmm. There it was, having made however many universes that were deterministic. This is, the actual origin of this uh, line of thinking came, starts with the question, why do we not know we're enlightened? Especially in the Dzogchen framework, we're already enlightened, we just don't realize it, we need to realize it and wake up. So how could we not know that? Mm -hmm. Well, as we start working it backward, think back to what happens if you were the only being in existence? And there you are. And you made a universe and you planned it infinitely and you watched it go out before you. And then you realize, this is boring. I know how the story is going to end. I know everything that's going on. What the hell's with that? That's useless. You try to talk to us. You want to have a conversation. You end up just talking to sock puppets because there's nothing else but you. No matter how much you put that over here, it's still a sock puppet coming down. And tickle yourself. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. So out of that boredom, out of that self-love, out of that profound love, that being did the most painful, most harmful possible thing it could do for it and everyone else's sake. It divided itself. It let itself create fragments of itself that, and here's the horror of it that needed to happen. It distorted each one so that it couldn't quite hear the harmony of the world. So it thought it was an individual alone and isolated. And each entity that spread out from there became its own isolated entity. But the point is, is that it can find its way back home. And the summary of our purpose for being is to be able to come back home to God, the goddess, and tell her a joke she hadn't heard. Yeah. We are to contribute to the whole of things. And you find in like in the Timaeus, the concept of the creation that goes on. And then the Demiurge stops and says to the younger gods, no, you and everyone else must continue creation. Otherwise, it will be incomplete and thus imperfect. Right. And so all the gods continue and all of us continue. And what we get out of Thelema is we have our own aspects of this stuff to create ourselves. And if we don't, we don't fulfill our lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, well, I love the idea of continuous creation and that, you know, we have a role to play in carrying it on. Um, but, you know, this... But the advantage of the magician is we can go back to the moment of creation, remember ourselves there, and then bring that forward again. You go, okay, that's always here, isn't it? Right. Okay, let's keep working. Right, yeah. And that's part of the great advantages of actually being a magic user or, or, or a, a priest is that a lot of these things that are theoretical for people well, we know how to go find and experience ourselves. And then they're not theory anymore. We know, we know what that herb tastes like. No one can tell us what that tastes like. We can taste the oregano. And you know, it's like, how can you describe the taste of oregano? You're not gonna be able to. All of the qualia, all the sensory stuff is completely gone. But so are all the highest things of all, the eternal objects, they're, they're not really describable. We can model them to some extent, you know, abstract geometry and the like, but they're never quite there. Yeah. But yeah. we can experience them directly. Right. Sure. Um, 
so but it sounds to me like the the sort of cosmogony you just described it it's the shattering you know of of the divine oneness seems to me to that is the story of the fall isn't it but then there's uh, the no, no because you can't actually lose the oneness well right that's why the fall isn't final <laughs> no, no 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 it's not a fall hmm. it's not a fall it was intentional it was good this was a greater good as Nui says i am divided for love's sake right chance of union and out of that being's love and out of that being's love for us all it gave us each individuality and freedom. Yes. We don't live in a deterministic cosmos. We live in a cosmos in which we can choose, and the consequence of our choices ramifies on ourselves and our world. Mm -hmm. That's how we learn and grow. Mm -hmm. Right. But so it, 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 this, was, mm -hmm. this was an endarkenment to permit individuation and illumination. Sure, sure. I mean, I think that's how I would always read the um, the notion of the fall in the whole um, context of Genesis, biblical uh, cosmogony, because um, even in Augustine, you get the sense of Felix culpa, right? Uh, oh, blessed sin, like, yes, it needed to happen as an act of, uh, in order to allow an, an, an act of restorative love. So yeah, but you're talking Augustine, okay? And then he puts all the blame on us and all that. Well, kind of well stuff. okay. I, I mean, I'm I not turn that completely yeah. around. I, I won't. I won't. Uh, I'll challenge any time you go into the Christian framework. I know it way too well. And yeah. I know what its consequences are, which are horrific and incredibly destructive. This most most vicious and vile concepts that humans have ever had poured into their brains is uh, horrific. The notion Christianity of in general, it's a horrible, horrible religion. Um, Judaism is actually one of the old traditional religions that's kind of making its way. So I don't really understand quite how Judaism and of course Judaism is highly pluralistic. So you don't all have to agree. Oh, it's it. Christianity. No, nah, nah, it's got way too much dogma and doctrine, even though if they are, there are 40 million different churches, literally, and they don't all agree with each other, which shows you the lack of unity within that framework and the horror that's there. Nonetheless, the theology that lies behind it is fundamentally mm. utterly destructive. I think I, I mostly agree. But if you, um, if you enter into practice and, and shed all of that kind of sin notion, but enter in with the fundamental notion that your holy guardian angel has been trying to talk to you since the beginning of your existence in this incarnation, and wrapping on the outside of your ogoitis soma, your, your egg-like body that is your pneumatic shell, is trying to get your attention. That has always been there. It has never been anything but trying to help you. And once you make that connection, then it teaches you how to hear it better. And then eventually, so you hear it so well that you absorb it and you find yourself in direct communication with the all and the one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have any programming background? In, I wish. Um, okay. I'd be a wealthier man if I did. <laughs> well, there's a thing called object-oriented programming. Oh, sure, yeah. And the first object is object. And that's the one. And what the one gives us is our entitative nature. And because of this other quality of boredom leads to freedom as well, that we're given the freedom to choose. And that's part of our individuation. And this leads to what we understand from, well, two really weird sources, one Swedenborg and the other Jane Roberts, who both in their own visionary experiences realize that the world is about a place to learn and to grow and to create and do our part in there and thereby advance our souls. Sure. So I, I think I um, I am most of the esoteric literature that I've read actually is coming out of um, a lot of Rudolf Steiner's work. Ah, yeah, sure. Um, which is you know I'm, my as I mentioned when we started our conversation my um, <clears throat> amount of reading I've I've read you know the Neoplatonists and um, but I haven't really delved too deeply into Crowley's work. I haven't really. Um, uh, I'm not a practitioner of, of, of ceremonial magic or anything like that. Um, but my, the, where I have dipped in is through anthroposophy, through the hermetic tradition. And there are a lot of hermetic Christians in the history of you know, okay. Europe. And um, a lot of, I, I just see Christianity as a very pluralistic thing, actually, as, just as much as Judaism is. But um, a lot of what what you're talking about for me i can translate into the terms that steiner uses 
um, though for him it's and you know I'm my dissertation was on Whitehead and Schelling mm. who's I think you could put him in the hermetic Christian sort of or even Kabbalistic Christian mm. uh, maybe is a, is a fair descriptor mm. for his work um, and you know these are thinkers you know Schelling in particular takes the theology of the fall seriously but not as um, not as a final condition. And the idea of uh, the, you know, our, our, our angel, you know, sort of knocking on our eggshell, trying to get our attention is, is for him, it just, he just calls that Christ, you know? Right, uh, that style. is one of the most heinous lies that has ever been taught. So, so who, who is it? It's your angel, your individual, unique connection huh. to the all. And I think to substitute a deity form in there is one of the most evil things you could possibly do to a person. Uh -huh. Well, I, I, I see where you're going. Definitely. Yeah. Um, but I think the, the, the intention as an esoteric Christian like Steiner would say was for the, the notion of for Christ to be uh, deeply in an individual, a, a matter of individual freedom and individual realization. Right, so I think that any 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 um, set of religious symbols can be misused, right? And it's true that historically Christianity has been, beginning with the way that it 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 became the brand of the Roman Empire, um, and and since <laughs> uh, the the way that it it helped to justify colonialism, slavery, uh, the the genocide of the you know. So certainly, I I, I agree with with its historical impact as a um, cultural code. Right, but as somebody who takes deity seriously, I blame yeah. the God. Really? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think the God um, damaged himself, and that's why- Who is Christ? Let's talk about that. Is, is Christ like, Luc like Lucifer or- No, the... no. The, um, Yahweh split him, tried to get rid of his shadow mm -hmm. and split off Satan. Because Lucifer is not actually a Christian concept. That's that's actually um, the Latin term for um, phosphoros, which belongs to a variety of deities, um, light bringer, um, uh, Hecate being one of them. That's one of her titles. Um, mm -hmm. But in splitting himself in four, he rejected that three, that one, and created this uh, uh, triadic framework that is perverse, and it's always going to keep hurting people wherever it goes because he's not a whole god anymore. Mm. And eventually, I've seen out in the future that he actually gets it together again, but that's like eons and eons out there. Right now, we're dealing with a deity who's actually just a minor tribal deity who decides that he actually wants to interfere in history. <laughs> what a ridiculously, he, he clearly has no, no real aspirations, no real uh, drive to make himself better. He actually is mucking around in history and cares whether or not anyone worships him? None of the gods do. The gods give to us out of their beneficence. They need nothing from us. Mm. Any of the rules and regulations they provided were entirely for our benefit, nothing to do with them. Mm. But for Yahweh, different story. Mm. Yahweh created a perverse version of theurgy that we get through Dionysius the Arad Paget that is the one thing you can do wrong in theurgy, which is worshiping one god because it will utterly distort you. The most mm -hmm. dangerous thing you can do. And Catholicism gives it this incredible ritual power behind it. And it, it spreads this through, well, we got a billion people these days. I experienced it. I was raised in a Catholic family. That's one of the reasons why ritual works for me. And my family turned Pentecostal when I was 16. Mm -hmm. So I got to experience this up close and personal. The first being who ever possessed me, and I, because of this, I don't actually tend to let this happen anymore, but I literally got by, grabbed by the scruff of the neck, exactly the way uh, Iamblichus and the um, Voudon people uh, describe it. Uh, it's an enormous pressure and heat and fire and words getting poured, forced out of my mouth. And I did it on a regular basis at prayer meeting until it nearly drove me insane. And I had to do a whole bunch of work to get myself back again. But the big problem was, is that it's a single deity with all of his particularity. And he's also a relatively, yeah, he's a terrestrial level deity. He's maybe celestial at best, but he's not one of the great. And so, so yeah. by aligning himself with the all, he can look like the creator. 
Who is, who is, who is, when you read Whitehead and, and look at his process theology, who is the God that Whitehead is describing? Or is, is this more of a, of, a, of a concept he's created, or is he oh, referring no, he's to that? Uh, the supreme ultimate. Okay. Which, um, so how do we, how do we think through the, the, the relationship between the idea of gods, plural, and the supreme ultimate God? Uh, the supreme ultimate is the one. It's the unity of all things. Mm -hmm. All of the particular, um, those primordial, uh, <clears throat> eternal objects that that one envisioned in their graded relevance to each other, thus creating the cosmos. Those are the elder gods, the, the uh, high gods, and those are the, the base set in the noetic realm, um, which is just below the one or just inside the one, depending on your framework. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of blend to produce more and more deities until the demiurge, uh, which is a low extension of the one, creates the cosmos, and then their logoi impregnate the cosmos, giving it form. Because remember, in, in Neoplatonism, matter has no form. Mm -hmm. Much like energy in our concepts of how energy works, it has no form, but other things have imposed upon it. Well, that's the eternal objects. Or in uh, the ancient world, this is the logoi of the gods. When their idea, uh, their idean, uh, ideas in the noetic realm, but in, and cosmically in this world, their logoi, their letting lay before themselves, their own essence is projected into here. And that essence is what creates the phenomenal realm that we live in. But it's just a blend of complex eternal, well, it forms complex eternal objects out of the, all the other objects that are there. Mm -hmm. And everything is composed of it. Mm -hmm. And thus, as the magicians say, you can use any object to find your way back to the gods because every object is an instance of the gods' presence. I like that. Yeah. Um, so you don't feel, what do you feel about Whitehead's um, attempt to, to sort of strip Christianity of the, uh, what does he call it? The um, tendency to imagine God in the image of a dictator or a um, imperial ruler or something. Do you think that, uh, you know, what do you think of, you know, theologians, like um, John Cobb and, and Charles Hartzorn, who I think taught your teacher in Chicago, um, Schroeder, uh, William Schroeder. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think that there is something salvageable in a process theological context about anything, I mean, the, the Christian liturgical life in any form, or does the whole religion need to be stamped out and and buried in the ground forever. I think that Christianity might actually have something to contribute if it would stop being the imperialistic asshole that it is. Right. So get rid of the Roman yeah. part, in other words. Yeah, if I go give it up. I mean, I don't care what uh, system of organization it wants to use. The fact that it would want to, one of the most evil things you could possibly do is make something somebody do something they don't want to do. And the yeah. church has always imposed upon people and told them how to behave. Right. And it has used that with incredible vigor and incredible violence down 1700 years now. Yeah. Um, so when it stops doing that, then maybe it can come to the table. And until it, it heals itself, it doesn't belong at the table. Is there, a, is there another human institution that hasn't done the same thing? And I mean, I'm thinking in terms of the way that institutions tend to operate. When you institutionalize a religion, it's going to try to impose its ideas on other, to make people behave in the way that it wants them to, mm -hmm. whether it's the DMV or, you know, the Catholic church. Mm -hmm. Well, um, that just shows the flaw in the way we treat each other. Yeah. Uh, as a Thelemite, I, my job is to respect other people's will and to know my own. And right. if they're smart, they will respect my will and let me know theirs so that we can do a collaborative kind of approach. Again, remember, I don't like competition. I like collaboration. I like building things. If I want a competition, I want to compete against nature and see how build a big, how big a building can we build? How fast a rocket ship can we make? You know, can I move matter from here to there without the intervening space? All that wonderful stuff. Those are the challenges that excite me, not getting out on the field and throwing a ball around and, oh, I have victory and somebody else has to lose. Yeah. After a number of times of winning games and feeling so horrible 
that my opponent lost. I never went back. Yeah. It's not worth it. There's no, there, a zero sum game. What's the point? I guess I loved competitive sports. I, you know, I played ice hockey for many years and mm -hmm. um, I loved losing in a twisted sort of dark way as much as I loved winning. Okay. It, it made winning so much sweeter to, to, uh, I was often on the underdog teams and had a few like breakthrough, you know, playoff runs. Great glory and fun. But for me, <laughs> part of a larger it's performance matrix, though. It's, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, well, it's, uh, it's what would I call it? Um, improvisational art or something. Fair. Fair. I get to wear my costume and there are certain yeah. rules we have to follow, but within those rules, I can improvise and hopefully score lots of goals. Yep. Um, <laughs> so let's see, what, how long have we been going here? I don't want to take a look. About an hour. Um, so um, we've covered so much interesting territory. Uh, w is there anything else that uh, you thought might be worth discussing with another Whiteheadian? Um, well, I, I probably should share with you some of my papers on this. The thing that came down to me as being the single most important part of this was to recognize how invocation works. Yeah. I discovered invocation, um, I was fairly abused as a child and had a miserable, fairly miserable childhood. I come mm -hmm. home from school very upset and very unhappy, I picked on at school and all that kind of stuff. I'm a little uncommonly intelligent and verbal, and that's a good way to get beat up at school. <laughs> yeah. um, and my brother had a, an eight track uh, tape of Quadrophenia by the Who. Ever hear of it? Mm -mm. Oh, okay. Um, maybe age difference there, but um, yeah, yeah. it's a, uh, do you know the Who? Do you know the Who? Is well, a, the, the, yeah, sure. I know the band. Yeah. Yeah. One of their albums, a very famous one, is called Quadrophenia. Mm -hmm. And it's built on a quadripartite um operatic kind of framework uh, yes. um, they know how to do that it's on spotify i'll check it out later <laughs> yeah yeah and um i would it, it i was um i had to deal with a lot of depression and i've had suicidal ideation since age three so having to move that was it's always actually <laughs> um, be that aware of death but as a three-year-old and... uh, i remember then mm -hmm. I, yeah um so um <clears throat> I would come home being pretty self-destructive, but instead of acting it, this is a piece of music that's about suicide. The entire thing is about a young man trying to find his way in the world and it ends in either he's dead or what he was is dead. As this motorcycle goes over the cliff and in the movie, we don't know if the actor or the character goes over the cliff too, or is it just the motorcycle, which is the symbol of all that stuff. And that's the beauty of art, but the music moves through those cycles of emotion mm -hmm. and i would come out of it purged of how i was feeling and i can go about my evening and such and over time i noticed this and over time i realized what i was learning and then as i started studying magic and learning the deeper and form, more powerful forms of invocation i began realizing it was really just the same principle of being able to move with the feelings you know, so as we teach people invocation it's say what you feel feel what you say it's a feedback loop and this is through the focused attention on these complex eternal objects, canalizing ourselves in a given vector, moves us from one state to another state. And once you own that, magic is now possible. Actual mm -hmm. religious, oper operational religion, you can do something with religion instead of merely believe it. And you get the gods involved and you work with them and they empower you. And that's their job. That's what they are trying to do. Right. But you have to plug in. Yeah. Well, I mean, I appreciated what you said earlier at the beginning of our conversation uh, that ritual and magic are, when you go back far enough, the same thing. Yeah. Um, and that, in a way, um, religion isn't belief based. It's not just you believe these ideas and you're saved. It's it's something you do. Uh, religion is something you are and something you do. Um, There's only one religion that cares about what you believe. <laughs> Christianity. Even in Islam, they don't even care whether or not you believe it. Once you say the, uh, the, the I forget the name of the phrase that you know, there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. That's it. Now you're a Muslim, and if you renege on that, we get to kill you. Uh, but they don't care whether or not you believe it. You just submit, which is Islam. Mm -hmm. Submit. Yeah. No other religion actually cares. And when you talk to Hindus about it, they go, Yeah, I know what I believe. 
but it's different from what I used to believe as a kid. Yeah. Different as a young person, now as a parent, and I suspect it'll be different when I get older, and I will worship different gods in each of these different time periods of my life. Mm. Yeah. So there's, I mean, um, another influence on my thinking is the contemporary philosopher um, and sociologist of science, Bruno Latour. Hmm. I've heard the name, but I don't know. Him. So he, he's a Catholic, and he wrote an essay recently about um, how belief and the belief in belief mm -hmm. has ruined not only religion, uh, but science as well, mm -hmm. and politics, um, yeah. because uh, the whole notion of uh, the epistemology, the understanding of the mind's relationship to reality underlying this notion of belief um, is... is dangerously abstract. Um, and so he's trying to restore the sense of practice to, and, and, and uh, ritual activity to religion. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to point out that science isn't about belief either. Science oh, is, no, hell no. is <laughs> the furthest thing from belief. Um, you know, and, and, that, and that politics isn't, uh, I, I don't wanna get too into it, but. Well, we have to separate the different things that we mash into that world word. Exactly. There is the epistemological use of the word, and then there's the um, value-laden version of the word. It's like, I believe in democracy. What you really are saying is, I assert the value of democracy as a governmental system. That's, that's a different thing, yeah. but we use this word belief too casually. The epistemological sense of it, we can go back to old Paul of Tarsus there, who, who was having trouble selling Christianity to the Roman men because it meant cutting off the tips of their dicks. <laughs> and they just couldn't deal with it. So he described, came up with the idea of being circumcised of heart so you didn't have to cut yourself to become a Christian. Yeah. That's and this right. becomes this entire idea of asserting things in the face of reason and fact. And it's rich if you read to the church fathers. I mean, they're just hating on the Greeks, which mean the Hellene, which means basically the entire ancient world culture. Because Helene, by this point, is the general name people took for those who were educated and participating in the larger culture that was in the Mediterranean basin. They called themselves Helene, and Iamblichus is one of the first people who actually refers to it from a religious framework. Hmm. And this is the word that the ch church fathers use to beat on, and gets translated as the Greeks. But it's right. not actually the Greeks, because... A all, bunch of them are in Syria, a bunch of them are in Lebanon and the Palestine. Greek culture, maybe. Well, it's the, the remember, Greek is the universal culture mm -hmm. of the Mediterranean and all the way into India, intentionally. Mm -hmm. um, um, Thomas McEvely's The Shape of Ancient Thought. Oh, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, shows how the Greeks open sourced themselves as opposed to the Vedics who said, no, no, we're gonna keep all the Sanskrit to ourselves. They went around, they simplified their language and they taught everybody Koine. And then that became the trade language and the diplomatic language and let everybody communicate with each other. And boy, did they. We didn't even talk about alphabetic technology as a ma magical technology, but um, maybe next time. <laughs> well, did you ever read uh, Leonard Schlein? Oh, the alphabet and the goddess. Yeah, yeah. versus the goddess. Versus the um, I got to interview him. He was, he's a very charming man. Um, he's a vascular, uh, neurovascular surgeon. Right. If you had to get somebody crawl inside your brain and dig something out, he would be the guy to do that. So he kind of knows the brain in a different way than most people, including <laughs> neurologists and such. He knows the plumbing. And that was part of what was motivating him as he went on a trip. And everywhere he went, First, there was this goddess temple here. They killed off the goddess and they put this other temple on here. And after about 40 of these in a row, he had to ask the question, what the hell happened? Yeah, right. And as somebody who's heavily learning disabled, I have, I have very severe learning disabilities, um, I couldn't write until I got a keyboard. Huh. And it totally changed my ability to write. What I, I have, a, as it were, a memory leak in my text processor, writing by hand and my memory goes away. I can't remember <laughs> anything. But if I'm keyboarding, I can write for hours. It takes 10 minutes by hand and I'm gone. I'm Look, really fascinated by that uh, difference. Um, I don't have that issue with writing, but I do find a different kind of thinking is accessible when writing by hand than when typing. Yeah. Typing, I can think a lot faster. Mm -hmm. And the problem I have with writing often is I can't write the sentence fast enough yep. to actually capture the thought and I end up forgetting what I wanted to say. 
you know, so uh, interesting. Yeah. The way that these uh, technologies shape our consciousness. Well, part of it uh, for me was in, in the sorting of this out, literally, I was, I was taking my qualifications at the University of Chicago and watching the data going while I'm trying to write the blue book. I failed the test miserably, but I went home and spent the next several hours in deep meditation, rerunning the tapes on it, watching these pieces go, and learned a whole lot about myself, including the fact I have a fundamental problem with anything verbal. I don't think verbally. Mm. And it was the first time that I began the inkling of this and then I kept chasing it and realized I have a translation layer in here that I use to communicate with people. It's way too slow. It's way too inefficient. When I need to work on anything, I get away from that. And I think of in the spatial temporal terms that I use, textures and flows, basically process. I can envision the complex system. And what I've done for a living is map complex systems, amongst other things. Um, I go into businesses and they tell me their processes and I draw them diagrams on how everything works and they go, oh, that's so precious. I've, I've, I've ended auditors sessions by coming in with one of my diagrams and saying, is this what you need? And they said, yeah, we're done now. They were expecting a two week audit. They were there about 20 minutes because this is the process. What else do you need? Right. And so what I learned was I don't actually think in verbal terms. I do everything is it's kind of like a, a ball of thread. When it's all balled up, it's all simple and complete. And then if you want to speak it, you have to kind of pull the threads out. It's long and slow and tedious. I can't think that way. Get that out of I deal with the thing as a whole. I wonder, I mean, I've I've thought about and written a little bit about um, what I call diagrammatic thinking. I wonder if that's in any way getting at what you're just trying to describe. Um, visual yeah. uh, mapping of how things work, yeah. Of, of, um, of locales, loci, and, and flows, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, I think. Sit in a room and scan the room and then look for the heat sources in the room. And let yeah. your imagination see the thermal radiance off of all those heat sources. Yeah. Watch yourself map all that, and you probably already have been doing that. What was part of my advantage of what I get used for in some companies, I literally, it's like they'll describe something, and I'll draw a picture of it. And here's the graph describing the thing you just said. And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that's what I meant to say, but I had to use words. Yeah. You can, my mind automatically goes to visual representations of things. And I have to like shut my eyes and, and kind of not listen at a certain level and let these pictures get painted. It's a fairly intuitive kind of thing. And they're very useful when doing business or doing construction. Yeah, you know, it's like, I can see the thing. I, I tried to teach myself uh, German idealism, the sort of movement of thought from Kant through Fichte, Schelling and Hegel and Goethe mm -hmm. that diagrammatically. Sure, cool. um, um, I can share that with you, but it, I really, th there's a form of thought, a uh, thought process that unfolds um, in, in the, the geometrical form of these diagrams that I, I can describe verbally and certainly I, I help to sort of um, flesh out what I mean when I, when I draw the diagrams, but there's something in the diagrams that I can't even quite capture. And they're not to mention the fact that they're a great mnemonic um, that sort of intensifies and, and creates a resonance chamber in my mind to like amplify understanding. So I, I think I really appreciate what you're saying. And you're very articulate for someone who, who says they're not really uh, skilled at um, verbal learning, you said, right? Well, I'm also good with words, but it's not actually how I think. I see. My family, um, we used to argue at the dinner table and those kinds of, I mean, like argue over abstract concepts. It was like, here, here's, here's an idea, debate it. Here, you take the power, oh, you take the con, get at it. <laughs> My family did that for, for entertainment. I mean, that's what we did. Yeah. But um, basically I could say anything that I wanted, but I had to be able to explain myself. And so from a very early age, I labored to try to explain my experience and put word to it. And between a fair degree of intelligence, a good literary background, a family that was very verbal and gave me a whole lot of word tools to use. Um, I built up a, a, a fairly good armament. And then I spent all of my adult life trying to explain really complex things, religions and all this kind of stuff. So I've developed some good tools, but 
in the process, I also realized that this is secondary. Mm. This is not actually the greater strength that I have of modeling these things by this other approach. That's visual, tactile, flows, motive. Right. Well, um, part of my job uh, is higher ed administration and um, boy, we could probably use your services <laughs> to help us figure out the bureaucracy that we've created for ourselves. But um, So how is CIS doing these days? Well, we are, like most universities, um, totally virtualized, which luckily in the last several years, many of our programs had already started that process. I heard, yeah. Um, we weren't eliminating residential programs, but we had created sort of online replicas. <laughs> And, uh, and that was going well. And the, in the philosophy and religion department that I teach in, um, we had just launched our online doctoral program last fall and the online masters had been going since 2017. So we were kind of ready for this. Um, it's a real, it's a tremendous loss not to have the community um, in the building. Yeah. So much learning takes place. I mean, a lot of learning takes place most of it at the personal interpersonal level and um, you know we were trying already in the online pro program to recreate that uh, we use zoom a lot we um, we have a retreat at the Esalen Institute every year for the whole community of students and alums to gather hopefully we can do that in the spring but uh, we live in a very uncertain uh, epoch where um, I don't know how long this virus is going to stick around or what the world's going to look like even a month from now, much less uh, next spring. But um, in general, CIS is uh, weathering the storm. A lot of other small schools are being shut down. Um, and so far, that's actually been a, a benefit to CIS because there's a lot of qualified higher ed people looking for jobs. Yeah. Um, our enroll, our, the number of applications that we're getting is skyrocketing. Cool. I think sometimes when there are economic downturns, sure. people go to graduate school. Yep. Um, and the student loan racket is still going uh, at full speed. So um, people can't get jobs. So, or they were just let go from the job they had. And so they're going back to school. And while many other schools are closing, CS is still open. So for now, it seems like. Um, we're well positioned. The school's been around since, you know, its earlier institutional incarnation was called the um, American Academy of Asian Studies. Mm -hmm. it, it emerged in the mid 50s during the San Francisco Renaissance and Haridas Chowdhury was the first president and the Sanskrit professor um, Friedrich Spiegelberg was there. I'm not sure if you know this history or not, but I know some of it. Um, I almost went to CIAS. Oh, very good. Yeah. I've known people who taught there over the years and such. Sure. Um, yeah. So, yeah, anyways, I don't know how it's managed to survive as long as it has. <laughs> well, it sounds like you were leaning in the right direction in the first place, you know, working up to more and more online stuff. And then when you had to, you made the rest of the jump. Um, I work for a small subsection of Kaplan, you know, Kaplan uh, test prep and all that kind of okay, thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we were a separate company that actually helped people with engineering, um, architecture, surveying and something else um, and we six years ago dropped our in-person classes and we've been progressively moving to a completely online framework and this was and then when we got bought out by Kaplan uh, there was like there was no need to have the building because half our staff was already scattered around the country so we dumped the building and yeah. all of us moved into our homes at the end of the year at the end of 2019 so we're all busy working away and then looked up as like Oh hell, everybody's locked down, but oh well. And we're just getting droves of students because what do you do when you get laid off? Okay, let me get my, if you wanna be an engineer, there are two different licensings you have to get, a fundamentals and then a, a professional. So if you don't have it, you don't get hired. Right. So if you're an engineer, you got all gone on, gotten that degree with all that work, they get their paperwork done and get this stuff and we help people to pass their tests. You know, it's making me realize that while for, for young kids in primary education, um, elementary, middle, and, and high school, this sucks because their schools are, you know, what are they supposed to do?
but for older people in graduate school, um, this is actually, I, I think it's giving, I'm hoping that this COVID um, uh, crisis helps to jolt higher education out of its sleepwalking um, because it really did need to uh, course correct, I'll, I guess is a polite way of putting it. <laughs> Um, I don't know if moving totally online is the answer, but I think doing two things simultaneously, which is making education more accessible, which could mean more online. Um, but also, I think there's something to be said for the experience of sort of living and breathing the life on campus um, to be immersed in learning communities, sharing meals together, not just in the classroom, you know. So, but a different kind of educational experience that's maybe based around retreats and intensives rather than like 15 week semesters, more like a week long intensive and otherwise it's online. I don't know, It's that's a model that CIS is moving towards. Um, so you can get relatively small groups of people together. You can even like test them as they come in the door. It's like, yeah. here, you got it, you got it. You're good, good, good. You can all come, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to take this one online. <laughs> you know, and right. get people together and to do that kind of stuff and then have, you know, really intensive times during it. Yeah. Um, it's, it'll be interesting. I'm, I'm hoping, my, my sincere hope is that so many people have had to stop, that they're going to ask themselves the question, was what I was doing a good idea? Yeah. Did the society that I was participating in, does it make sense? Should we continue doing that? And my yeah. prayer is that we'll all wake up going, wait a minute, I didn't want to be doing that in the first place. I had to survive. You know, Bucky Fuller's comment and you know, the idea, what was the thing that I would think, thought I wanted to do before I discovered I had to, uh, had to make a living, you know? And all these people having a moment to pause. And what are they gonna do? And I think that's partly what we're seeing with the Black Lives Matter stuff. There's a whole lot of people going, no, this is just wrong. Yeah. And they're standing out there and they're saying, no, let's stop this. And who knows what that will breed? People having power saying, wait a minute, I actually have a voice. I actually can speak up and speak speak to power. And some of the stuff we're seeing out of Portland is imme immensely creative. And now Trump is doing the one thing that actually could break up the union. You don't send secret police anywhere. That's the surest way to discredit your government. Right. And we'll see where it turns. But it's also making people wake up and realize maybe this matters. Yeah. And if they become, they wake into their power, they might actually decide, you know, all these things that are going to kill my grandchildren, I don't want them to. Mm -hmm. Let's change this. And we yeah. can. Now's the time. We've got about 10, maybe 15 years. If we work really, really hard, we can turn the course. Right. And a bunch of that means we can't be, we can't be trying to make so much profit for 1% of the population. It's ridiculous. There is plenty to go around. Mm -hmm. uh, like Confucius said, if you live in a, time, in a country that it, it, is, it is shameful to be poor in a well-run country. It is shameful to be wealthy in a poorly run country. Right. And that's yeah. what we need to say to these billionaires. It's like, it's pot lots or pitchfork, son. <laughs> you either need to like understand about, we will give you honor and many bennies once you've pulled yourself down under a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody needs more than a billion dollars. Nobody. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, this is why I say that uh, money is not private property. It's a public good. Uh, and, yes. you know, it's a means of communication. And right now we have a, a, patholo a, a, a pathology in our economic language, yeah. you know, that's, that's uh, building these, it's leading, it's funneling money into these cancerous growths um that are just strangling our society um well hey uh thank you yeah sam this has been a lot of fun um i hope we can do this again and i hope we can do it i hope we can just have a chat in person one day and uh you know maybe uh are you still in berkeley uh, no i live uh, north of there uh in north? technically richmond okay oh great well, close enough, and maybe one day uh, in the not too distant post COVID future, we can uh, gather with with Stephen Goodman and uh, Aaron Weiss and and oh other friends to uh, that'd be fun. Yeah, to do a little um, symposium or something. <laughs> that would be awesome. Cool. Well, all right. Um, take care of yourself, and uh, 
Thank uh, you very much for being in touch. I really appreciate it. You've been very warm and uh, very welcoming. I've really enjoyed our conversation. I very much hope we get to do more of this. This is the best stuff in the world to me, meeting people who are interested in the same stuff I am. We can have great conversations and learn from each other and get different points of view and all of that. It's incredibly valuable. And uh, uh, you seem like a nice guy. I, I, I enjoy meeting you. And so I look forward to uh, cultivating this future. Likewise, Sam. Uh, so um, I appreciate that. I live for this too. And uh, I really enjoyed uh, the terrain that we covered and the, uh, the, the uh, you know, intimate, um, you know, thought as a form of perception and, and in dialogue with you, I feel like I saw things and felt things that I hadn't before. So I appreciate that. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Wish All right. You best. Likewise. Have a, have a good evening and uh, until we meet again. <laughs> Bye now.